You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Soul Catcher by James Patrick Kelly Performed by Otis Jiry After years of planning and scheming, of deals honest and not, of sleepless nights of rage and cool days of calculation, Clary's moment arrives when Zenny Harville Asher, the ambassador from the Four Worlds, enters her gallery. As a concession to local xenophobia, the Zena is embodied as a human male. Of course, he is beautiful. Some liken the Zenny to the fairies of Earth legend, their charisma so intoxicating that, at the merest nod, a groom will walk away from his new bride, a mother will abandon her infant. Is it telepathy? Pheromones? The lure of great wealth and power? No matter. Clary has steeled herself against the Zenny's insidious power, Ever since the ambassador made Planetfall, Clary has been on a regimen of emotion suppressants. Not that she really needs them. After Zenny Harville Asher ruined her life, Clary has had just one emotion. No chemistry can defeat it. Her hopeless assistant, Ellerin, makes a fool of himself, groveling before the Zenny. Clary slips behind a display case protecting a cascading sculpture of lace and leather and spun sugar. She is content for now to study her prey. The zenny is slight, almost childlike, but he commands the room with eyes as big as Clary's fists, a smile brimming with wide teeth. Slender hands emerge from the drooping sleeves of his midnight jacket. His fingers are delicate enough to pluck the strings of a harp or a woman's heart. Here at Hamishy's Fine Textiles, we have the best collection. Elrin is talking too fast. Yes, this one is sure you do. Asher cuts him off. This one would speak with the owner now? Which means it's time. But when Clary steps from her hiding place, she sees that her plan is going hideously awry. Dear beloved lost Jannery, clone sister of her sibling batch, has followed her abductor into her gallery. Even though it's been fourteen years since they last saw each other, even though she has lost her name, her face, and her innocence, Janery knows her as her sister. How could she not? Her frightened stare pricks Clary's shriveled heart. All is lost. Yes, a reunion was part of her plan, but that was for later. And after this was over. Will she give Clary up? Can Jannery even guess what her sister plans to do? But there is no turning back. Ambassador, Clary steps forward and bows. You honor me. I am Clary Hamishy. Despite the suppressants, she braces herself against the Zenny's fierce regard. It's like leaning into a headwind. Welcome, sir. Zenny Harville Asher inclines his head. This one has heard tell of the local rug merchant, Friend Clary. She's not sure whether he intends this as a slight. Hamishy Gallery sells native and off-world carpets, yes, but this is no rug shop. Clary is too busy trying not to juggle at Jannery to take offense. She has not changed since the Zenny lured her away from their ancestral commune. Bitter years have aged Clary, and she has taken steps to smudge her appearance, but Jannery is still as striking as Clary once was. She has the rust-brown curls framing her pale features of their genetic line. She wears a high-necked white gown, perhaps to satisfy some ancient bridal fetish. Her sister shows no sign of anger or sadness as she shies behind the ambassador, as if she is afraid of Clary. Has she accepted her humiliation? Embraced it? Unthinkable. Clary tries to imagine herself in Jannery's place as her sister catches up the decorative glass chain that dangles from the choker around her neck. What? Asher notices her. She won't hurt you. Without a word, Jannery presses the end of her chain into his hand. 
One never knows what bothers the pet. Zenny Harville Asher does not apologize. It's been skittish today. Clary wants to yank the chain away, crush it in her bare hand, until shards of broken glass bite her. Not to worry, she says. She addresses the Zenny, not her sister. She is safe in this place. A pleasant enough shop. He gestures at the racks and display cases, the hangings and the shelves that line the walls. Might one find a present for a good friend here? A unique present, perhaps. Clary's smile is tight. She knows why the Zenny is here. Clary has paid an outrageous price to bait the trap, has discreetly encouraged the rumors about her illegal acquisition. But she must not rush. There's a scene to play before the final act. Let me show you my treasures. She tries to gesture for Ellerin to peel Jannery away, but her assistant is useless. Tomorrow Clary will fire him, if there is a tomorrow. The Zenny is not impressed with the lifelike nylon nudes wrapped around movable skeletons, nor does he appreciate the remarkable properties of nylon. It's semi-translucent, says Clary, so several layers of differently colored nylon produce the subtle skin tones. See how the artist's needle modeling suggests wrinkles about the eyes? Nor does he care for the bowls made of taut, coiled snuro, or the hanging of cloth beads arrayed on glow wires. Passes Tuk-Tut's mixed-media attention fabric sculptures without comment. Clary stubbornly describes a French tapestry from the 22nd century. Notice the classic border field with floral bouquets and architectural scroll work around the very fine floating landscape scenes from Old Earth. Depictions of Oriental life with courtiers seated on motorcycles. And see here, plants, birds, zombies. But Asher's already moved on past an area carpet in the Tabriz style by Master Weaver Kumanin and the chainmail business suits. Clary hurries to catch up. He flips through Fovian rugs hanging on a telescoping display like they were pages of a book he's deciding not to read. One wants something special for a special friend, he says. Then he leans close, too close, and for a second his huge black eyes erase all Clary's worries about her ruined plans. In that instant of domination, Clary feels something for her sister that she's never felt. Envy. There is more. She twitches free of the zenny, gathers herself. Work not yet priced. Items I had not intended to sell. Keep the best for yourself, a strategy to live by. He chuckles. Still, one might be interested to see, if not to buy. Of course, Ambassador. Although it might be best if your companion stayed with Ellerin. She raises her voice to arouse the bedazzled Ellerin. There may still be a way to salvage the plan, but Jannery must not see what is to come. No! Jannery is trembling. The Zenny glances over his shoulder, as if he has forgotten that she is following them. You've provoked the pet to speech, friend Clary. He gives her chain a tug, and she doubles over, eyes downcast. It's not often so bold in public. Want, her voice grates from disuse, to come. She raises her eyes just enough to meet Clary's horrified gaze. One is at a loss to explain this behavior. Worried lest the zenny punisher, Clary babbles. It's fine, not a problem. I just thought she... It would be more comfortable out here. I live here, you see, and my rooms are rather cluttered just now. She gestures for them to follow, and when the zenny hesitates, she almost makes the mistake of putting a hand on the ambassador's shoulder to steer him toward the rear of the gallery. Please, she says. It would be my pleasure. Ellerin, you can close up and go home. The fewer witnesses, the better. Ellerin. Most accommodating friend Clary. Asher lets Jannery's chain go slack and gives it a tinkling shake to get her moving. 
Be assured that the pet will be on a short leash. Clary has four rooms at the back of the gallery, bedroom, bath, galley kitchen, and the office where she eats and connects. The office is half again as big as all the other rooms combined. Clary had planned for this visit and has removed all traces of her sister's clones, their long-dead first in the world she lost when the family chose her to retrieve January. She has replaced mementos of that former life with pics of men she's never met. Clothes they might have worn hang in her closet. There is an artful scatter of presents she might have given or received had she dared intimacy. A vase filled with the latest air flowers, a reproduction ship's clock, a set of magma towels that serve as trivets, kites and crystal and antique hubcaps. But what draws Asher's attention is the art Clary has kept for herself. The Zenny points at a chair and January sits. He coils a glass chain on her lap and she stares down at it glumly as if to read her fortune. Then he strides about the room inspecting the needle lace, hamaca, and Ringwell's blood-stained war quilt and Zeri Mary Carey's rap dog. He pauses in front of Kuminen's Tabriz carpet which hangs beside the bedroom door. But you have this one hanging in the gallery, he says. A reproduction ambassador, Clary says. This is the original, four hundred years old, priceless. Asher waves mention of money aside as if it were a bad smell. He is still not satisfied with Clary's wares. She has taken a certain pride in the taste with which she has built her collection, even if it is only a ruse to conceal her true intentions. The contents of her gallery in this room are all she has to show for the life she has led since January left with her zenny, and none of it interests him. She wonders now if any of it really interests her. One hears, Asher says, of a rug. Clary can feel the swirl of events turning him to her purpose. I have many rugs. Time passes, friend Clary. One does not gladly waste it. His voice changes, and abruptly they are no longer speaking. Instead, he is commanding. A living rug. A soul catcher. Clary gasps as she experiences the full force of the Zenny's charisma. Can ecstasy hurt? She knows the answer. That's supposed to be a secret. Not secret enough, friend Clary. Show. Clary staggers to the edge of the carpet in the middle of the office, feigning submission. Decorated with a motif of leaves and flowers on a field of blue, it is a 19th century reproduction of a 17th century original that was mentioned in Pope's survey of Persian art. She sinks to her knees, slips fingers underneath, and rolls it up to reveal a containment sunk into the floor three meters by five and a half meter deep. A sheet of X-glass, level with the floor, protects the contents. The zenny purrs. So it's real. As you see, Ambassador. Clary's soul catcher has no provenance other than horror stories told to scared children, created by the Malkin Collective as an instrument of punishment, it is not, strictly speaking, textile, although it began as a mat-like colony of carnivorous plants, genetically modified to assimilate those who refused collectivization. The rugs were the Malkin's tool to control dissidents. Since the collective was enlightened enough to ban capital punishment, those sentenced to incarceration in a soul catcher were functionally immortal as long as the colony survived. The Mockin Collective had collapsed some two hundred years ago, and Clary's soul catcher seems as healthy as the day it captured the first dissenter. A closer look, Ambassador. Clary points at the controller, and when the glass retracts, she presses both hands against the rug's translucent skin. As always, the surface yields to her touch, warm and silky smooth. Beneath, the head seemed to float in a clear yellow broth of amniotic fluid. Cheeks bump against her palm and sink away. Filmy, 
Calm eyes peer through her fingers, lips part, revealing dark, inert tongues. Tangles of veins and arteries, bruised blue and red, squiggle as blood surges. Hairy bundles of ganglia connect the minds of the colony of the damned. Clary has always found the pulse of the soul-catcher hypnotic. She has spent hours at its side, hoping for some sign from those within, listening not with her ears but with her fingertips. There have been nights when she has walked across it barefoot, and one when, in despair at her wasted life, she lay naked on it and contemplated slicing the skin and submitting to capture. She believes that the captured know what has become of them, that they are restless but not in pain. Suddenly she is startled out of her dream of communion with the heads. Asher kneels next to her and caresses the soul-catcher's skin with his perfect fingers. Alive? croaks Jannery. Without asking permission, she too has approached the open containment. Yes, murmurs the Zenny. But are they conscious? There's no way to know, Clary sits back. The stories say they are. They are singing. The Zenny muses dreamily. Do you hear that? Seeing that the Zenny is transfixed, Clary dares a glance at Jannery. Clary presses a forefinger to her lips and then nods at her sister's kneeling abductor. No, Jannery says. Misunderstanding, the Zenny glares at her and she wills back into her chair. One feels for their plight. Name your price. It's not for sale. It takes a moment for the Zenny's mouth to work itself into a smile. Not? I mean, you don't understand. This is a registered historical artifact. It's against the laws of our world to sell anything on that list. Then how did it come into your possession? A gift, Ambassador, from a dear friend. A dear friend who Clary had blackmailed. A parting gift that poor Therese had given as she and her husbands fled their creditors. Then this one must hope for your friendship, Clary. Clary realizes too late how close she is to the Zenny. She tries to scoot away. The Zenny rests its hand on Clary's shoulder. Perhaps an exchange of gifts. Ambassador? The hand unlocks years of grief and anger, Clary's blistering need for revenge. At the same time, she is so swollen with the Zenny's desire for the soul-catcher that her brain feels as if it's pressing against the inside of her skull. What she wants and what Zenny Harville Asher wants are so nearly the same. She must acknowledge their mutual desire. The Zenny must have the rug. That is the plan, and Clary must have her sister. But the plan is broken, useless. There is no plan. And Asher is so powerful, and she must say something or her head will crack. She must. She must. Would I... I would exchange. How can she talk while a fist of blood is punching her chest, clenching at her throat? I feel as if... She can't stop herself. Need help replacing Ellerin, useless Ellerin. She gestures wildly at the gallery. Help. Now it is all she can do to point at Jannery. Her. She hears her sister's strangled cry of anguish. Then the Zenny is across the room. Zenny Harville Asher thrusts a hand to Jannery's face, palm over her mouth, fingers splayed. Nothing, he says. You are nothing. She shakes beneath his grip. Say nothing. Clary reclaims her anger and flicks her forefinger to deploy the blade. She slices into the skin of the soul catcher. You want the pet, says the Zenny, who is still attempting to subdue Jannery. His back is to Clary and the soul catcher. Humans can't own humans. No, of course. Clary's nose fills with the sweet, 
yeasty smell of the amniotic fluid. Why did I say that? As if the Zenny didn't know. But I did, didn't I? She doesn't know what she's doing, only that she must do something. She babbles again. It's true that Ellerin is not the best. Not to own it, her. No, but I could train her, perhaps, as an apprentice. She's yours. Asher finally lets Jannery go. He stoops until her faces are at the same level. Nothing, he whispers to her. Clary realizes this is his name for her. As you worship and serve this one, Asher of Harville, you will now serve that one, Clary Hamishy. He breathes into her gaping, agonized mouth. Your new friend. Then he laughs. Clary shakes her head to clear it. Jannery is free. Wasn't that the most important part of the plan? She can stop now. But the price of all those years of suffering must be accounted for. Not only Jannery's, but hers. They're two wasted lives. She looks past the Zanny at her sister, who then meets her gaze with brutal reproach. She knows Jannery, then knows that she's about to warn Asher, who has taken everything from them. The plan, you stupid bitch, the plan. She hurls herself across the room, throws an arm around the shocked Zenny's neck and drags him back, kicking and grasping for air. Maybe he has something to say, a last plea for mercy, desperate words of command, but he is small, and Clary's anger is large. Clary, stop! Jannery screams, but of course, she is nothing. She thrusts Asher's head through the skin of the soul catcher into its roiling interior. Just then, Clary hears the captured. They are singing. To her? The song is deafening as she feels the stings of many lashes. They want her, too, but she releases her hold and falls backwards. Her dripping arm is covered in purple welts. The soul catcher appears to be swallowing the zenny whole, despite churning legs and flailing arms. But then it spits the headless body out. It slumps away, blood gushing over the rolled-up carpet, ruined. She remembers the man who sold her that carpet. His name was Lan, and they were lovers for almost a week before Clary felt herself becoming attached. Lan had the oddest collection of combs, silver, and bone, and glass, and gold. She had never met anyone before who collected combs. She wonders what became of him, of her life. Then she realizes that she's sitting in a puddle. She picks herself up. Janny stares at her. I did this for you, Clary says. Our sisters chose me to rescue you. No! Janney strangles on the word. You don't understand. I was going to buy you afterward, bring you home. You weren't supposed to know about this. Nobody was. The wound she has inflicted on the soul catcher is already healing. Asher's head grimaces and turns away from them. I had a plan, Janney. All this would have been a secret. What is it? in her sister's eyes. Hatred? Horror? Fear? She wonders, then, if anyone is coming to rescue her. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis if you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, thank you for listening and have a great day. God bless you.